Hi, Agroecology 103. It's Randy. I'm here to talk to you today about climate change. And in particular, I want to talk about how it's likely affecting us now and how it will affect us in the future. So the National Geographic has put out this very nice uh, website that uh, talks about the ways that climate change uh, will affect you. And I would say that it's not future tense. And it's really uh, categorized into these five areas, water, crops or agriculture, heat, weather, and health. So when we talk about warming water, uh, as they say here, whether it's liquid, solid, or gas, water is critical to uh, life on the planet. Uh, we depend on it for drinking water. We depend on it to water our crops. Animals obviously depend on it, et cetera. And uh, what's clear is that the uh, water on the planet is warming as a result of climate change. The second area is agriculture, and in particular, uh, we're looking at significant crop changes as a result of climate change. So uh, this map that they put together on this site shows you areas where um, agricultural crops are actually likely to yield more, and those are the green areas. These are gains greater than 5%. And you can see here that those areas where gains will happen tend to be in the global north, and they tend to be uh, places where productivity is already reasonably high, although we will see an encroachment uh, farther north uh, to make er some areas productive that otherwise haven't been. So you can see vast parts of North America, in particular uh, Canada, and uh, parts of Northern Europe and to Russia and, uh, and Northern China and whatnot are likely to become more productive. Areas that are orange are likely to uh, lose greater than 5% of their yields. So they're likely to become less productive than they are today. And uh, so you can see that those areas, unfortunately, are concentrated in areas that are more impoverished today than the areas in the north, generally speaking. So let's just say uh, the haves are, going, are likely to um, fare better in a changing climate than the have-nots. And uh, that this is an issue of environmental justice, social justice. Uh, we can talk about it in different ways. Uh, that's critically important. As you can see here, they uh, predict that corn is going to take uh, about a 24% hit in terms of yield. And this is because corn, as a C4 uh, photosynthetic uh, species, is uh, already um, sort of maxed out on the CO2 that it can uh, handle. That is, it's limited by other resources, nitrogen and water in particular. Uh, whereas these other species, wheat, rice, and potatoes, are likely to respond to uh, higher levels of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere by increasing their productivity. Now, that's not to say that they are so, also aren't limited by um, water and other nutrients. It's just that they also uh, they are more strongly limited now by CO2 concentration in the atmosphere relative to corn. We're also looking at higher levels of heat, uh, especially in urban uh, and suburban areas. Uh, this is going to result in uh, lots of human health effects as a result. And of course, we're looking at um, more erratic weather. So here they've depicted that as wilder weather. Uh, we're gonna see greater number of catastrophes. It's hard to argue that the um, number of um, climatological events that we see today likely related directly to a change in climate. Human health is likely to suffer as a result of the change in climate. So this cartoon depicts all the many ways that that's likely to happen. And here they have a long list of uh, the things that we can expect. More power outages, uh, undernutrition and hunger increasing. Uh, occupational hazards on the rise, infectious diseases like Lyme disease on the rise, mental health issues as folks deal with uh, higher levels of depression, more allergies and respiratory disease, mosquito-borne fevers on the increase, heat-related illnesses uh, uh, in senior citizens and, and children uh, in poor areas, uh, and then drought and chronic water shortages, and um, a restriction or a reduction in uh, freshwater supplies are all likely outcomes of the change in climate. Now let's take a look at the national picture for the U.S. and uh, these are predicted uh, changes in uh, maximum daily precipitation 
between now and the year 2090. The RCP 4.5 and the RCP 8.5 are just model scenarios, the 8.5 being more aggressive, uh, if you will, with respect to what the uh, change in climate is likely to be, uh, 4.5 less aggressive. In either case, they're both in, uh, predicting increased rainfall, especially in places like the Corn Belt, the upper Midwest, uh, where we sit here in Wisconsin. And this is going to have uh, significant ramifications for flooding events. We've already had tremendous uh, increases in the amount of flooding in the last uh, uh, decade or so locally uh, to the tune, th to the point where they're even uh, considering moving towns out of floodplain areas to get them higher up in the landscape to get them away from these flooding events. And this comes at a tremendous cost to uh, local and regional governments and the federal government as we uh, pay for, and, and to the tune of billions of dollars, rebuilding the infrastructure in, in local communities and whatnot, roads, bridges, etc. As we look at the same model output uh, for projected increase in the number of days over 90 degrees Fahrenheit between now and 2090 uh, under the two different uh, climate change scenarios, you can see that uh, even with the less severe scenario, there are likely to be many more 90 degree days uh, in farmland in important states such as Iowa, Missouri, and Kansas, Wisconsin in, uh, included. And uh, so as we've talked about already, uh, increased heat load is going to be uh, have a tremendous effect on human health, but it's also likely to uh, affect the production of, of cropping systems. So when we project yields under these scenarios, it's a pretty grim situation for lots of the U.S. As you can see here, agricultural yields are going to uh, decline significantly in, in the heartland and the Corn Belt in particular. Hardest hit will be states like Missouri, Illinois, Nebraska, but you can see here that uh, the upper Midwest, uh, including Wisconsin and Minnesota and Iowa, will also be hit hard. And uh, the ramifications of this are not just lower yields. Well, the ramifications of this are uh, problems for uh, folks who work in the fields, uh, problems for folks who work in barns, etc. So farmers and farm workers are going to face uh, what are going to be increasingly grueling and unsafe conditions. And of course, uh, the loss of crops, crop failures, and particularly bad years, and that sort of thing will uh, create a, a, an even heavier reliance of farmers on federally funded, taxpayer-funded support systems, whether it's crop insurance or subsidies uh, of, of all kinds. And so, uh, of course, and, and of course, those who don't have those types of safety nets will uh, probably go bankrupt and go out of business. And so we'll end up with more failing farms in uh, the rural heartland. And of course, this has really negative ramifications for uh, the communities in that part of the world. The communities will continue to decline with lack of uh, tax base, um, lack of uh, um, school opportunities for young people, and it really just creates this positive feed sp feedback, uh, this sort of tailspin uh, that uh, is very hard to, to pull out of. Now we can look at historical trends in uh, the state of Wisconsin. So this is backwards looking, not forward looking. This is back uh, looking at data from the period 1950 to 2018. And these data were uh, collected by Chris Kucharik, who's chair of uh, the Department of Agronomy and other folks in the Wisconsin um, Climate Change Initiative, Wiki. And uh, what you see here, if we look at uh, the top row um, that are mostly green, those are uh, changes in precipitation from 1950 to 2018. And so what you can see as you look at this is that the southwestern part of Wisconsin has gotten quite a bit wetter. Uh, all, all parts of the state have gotten wetter, but that's really been concentrated in the southwestern part of Wisconsin. If we look at uh, periods of the year that are broken down into winter, summer, spring, and fall, moving left to right, it's clear that northern Wisconsin has actually gotten a bit drier, especially in the spring and summer months. Uh, whereas overall, the trend has been an increase in 
uh, precipitation in that part of the region. If we look at the bottom row, we see the historical change in the annual minimum temperatures. So you can think of this as nighttime temperatures. This is as low as it gets uh, on a, um, in a particular place, as low as the temperature gets in a particular place. And what we see here is that the winter temperatures, which are the uh, second from the left uh, plot, are getting uh, quite a bit warmer in the northwestern part of the state and um, increasing in temperature, and we're getting warmer in the southern part of the state as well, but not to the same degree that we are in the northwestern part of the state. So the overall takeaway message from this work is that when we look backwards at the data and actually see what, how our climate is changing here in Wisconsin, uh, there's not really a simple answer. We can look at these left-hand plots and say, oh, generally things are getting wetter, Generally, things are getting warmer, but there are differences in the seasons that are really important because, as you can imagine, if it gets a lot wetter in the summertime when things are growing, that's going to have a profound effect on net primary productivity. But if it gets a lot warmer in the springtime or the winter when things aren't growing, microbes are going to be stimulated. And if microbes are being stimulated, more respiration, more loss of carbon to the atmosphere, at a, in periods of time when plants are not taking up carbon and in times when plants are taking up carbon, it's hotter and so there's going to be less productivity overall, then the net effect is likely to be less NPP, so less carbon input to the agroecosystem, more microbial respiration, more carbon loss from the agroecosystem, and an overall net loss of carbon or a positive feedback of climate change to soil carbon. So while it's a very grim picture uh, with respect to the effects of climate change on human welfare and well-being, and particularly on agricultural well-being, uh, the agricultural sector's well-being, I want to turn now to uh, a video that talks more about uh, opportunities to help mitigate climate change, that is, opportunities to help slow and ultimately reverse climate change. Uh, and then I want to talk uh, after that in a video about climate adaptation, which is to say, uh, even if we completely mitigated and slowed climate change uh, starting today, there are still going to be climate change effects, and we have to, as a, as a species, figure out ways to adapt and deal with it.